welcome everyone to our year-end event. It's been a good year so far. So here you see my lovely background here. I'm tuning in from Winnipeg, Manitoba, and we had a good dump of snow a week or two ago. Um, it's all melted since then, but if you're wondering what my background image is, that is my work campus in southern Manitoba. So before we begin with this year-end event, I just want to acknowledge that we're all tuning in from many different locations here across Turtle Island, North America, and perhaps beyond. Uh, I personally, personally am tuning in from Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is the traditional territories of the Cree, Anishinaabe, Dene people, and the Métis Nation. We live according to Treaty 1, signed in 1871. So I invite you just to take a moment to reflect on your location, your relationship to the land, relationship to your community and to local Indigenous peoples. So let me introduce myself. My name is Rebecca Deal Schneider. I'm the first point on this list. And along with Judy, who's also in this event, we have had the joy of co-chairing the 50th anniversary celebration committee. What a party. <laughs> so Judy and I have co-chaired this group. Um, members include Bob, Joseph, Alan, and Asoya Waim. Many of you are in this call here today. So as a celebration committee, we started meeting a long time ago now, over a year ago, uh, and we created these goals to promote the CICA, to encourage our members, to learn about our members, celebrate our past, and discuss our future. So to achieve these goals, we brainstormed these initiatives. The 50th anniversary newsletter, a past president lecture series, anniversary swag, a Q&A with 50 CICA members, and of course the year-end event, which you're all a part of here tonight. So I'll just spend a few minutes kind of reviewing these initiatives just in case you didn't hear about them throughout the year. And then uh, we'll proceed into our speaker uh, for this evening, John Wood. First up, I wanted to highlight our newsletter because this is the first thing that went live in our anniversary year. So you see our wonderful cover page celebrating 50 years of fellowship. You can see the URL at the bottom of the screen there where you can download the anniversary newsletter and read it for yourself. You see that Bob Geddes, a member of our committee, acted as the editor and Mark McEwen, a co-editor. I put an image here of just our uh, table of contents so that you can see some of the excellent content in this publication. Comments from Janelle Curry, ASA president also in this event, Arnold Sykema, John Wood, uh, memories from the late Dan Osman, and then of course some contributions from Judy and myself as well as some uh, other news and notes there. I'll also highlight the truly Canadian scavenger hunt at the end. And so this is, I think, a fun committee that our group came up with. Just some ways that we can celebrate our beautiful country and the beautiful nature that uh, we can enjoy. And so if any of you have completed that scavenger hunt, it's not too late to send that our way. And so you can email that to any of us. You can find the anniversary email and contact information actually on the CSEA website. We'd love to hear a little bit about how you interacted with our with our country and our nature and how far you actually got in the scavenger hunt. I know for myself, as I read through this newsletter, I particularly was encouraged by some of the personal remarks, especially Arnold, some of the personal remarks and encouragement that you shared um, in your article here about a community reaching out. Um, I think that's what draws a lot of members into the CSCA is the community aspect. So I would just encourage people to read this newsletter if they haven't already had the chance and think about how you can reach out and bring new people into the CSCA as well. So one event that went on throughout the year was this past president lecture series. And so we kicked that off with Robert Mann in BC, you see his fun title there, To Infinity and Beyond, 50 Years of Exploring Science and Faith. He gave two talks in Vancouver. And then throughout the year, we had Gary Partlow, Arnold Sykema, James Peterson, Patrick Franklin, and then the series concluded with past president Janet Warren. And so many of these talks took place in cities across our country. I hosted Janet here in Winnipeg. 
And so I think it was great to have some in-person events throughout our local chapters and to also have some online participation as well. I know some of the videos that have been posted online already are getting some views. So feel free to check out the recordings uh, and catch up on any of these talks if you miss them. I also want to note the role that these past presidents have played in the CICA. Obviously, we likely wouldn't have gotten to this anniversary if it wasn't for the leadership and the support that I think these people and others have given to the CICA. So I, when I think of, you know, how do we want to celebrate the CICA, I think about our past presidents and the leaders shown on this slide. So I thank all of them for their hard work and their support and their passion. Like we've already mentioned, we've given out some fantastic anniversary swag this year, some anniversary toques. I meant to grab mine, but yeah, some fantastic little hats, t-shirts that many of us are wearing here. So we had these available for purchase at the ASA annual meeting, which was definitely a highlight of the year. So if you haven't had a chance to pick up a shirt or a toque, I know that there are some local chapter leaders that have some available. And so maybe if you make it out to some upcoming CSEA events, you may have the opportunity to win one or purchase one uh, and get in on this fun. I know that I will be wearing my toque in Winnipeg because the next six months are probably going to be quite cold. So that will come in handy. The next initiative I wanted to highlight is our Q&A with 50 CSEA members. Uh, certainly this was a lot of work, but I think also a lot of fun. Uh, I know for myself, who I consider myself to be still a fairly new CSEA member, there's still many of you I don't know well. Um, it was just a great way for me and I think for others to get to know some of the members that I haven't had a chance to chat with much yet. Um, and so this initiative involved um, or will involve up to 50 CSEA members. Um, here you can see we published our 40th one just a couple of weeks ago, and so we're working our way up to 50. So you can read about these. There's social media posts kind of alerting you to them, but the full responses are actually on the CSCA blog on the website. So you can go to csca.ca slash blog and actually read all of them. And so each person, Robert Dean, myself, and many of the other members that have participated so far answered three questions one about science, one about scripture, and one about Canadian scenery. So I think it's just a great way to combine science and faith in our Canadian location and get to know each other and celebrate our members a little bit. So one of the last things I wanted to encourage you to think about is just ways that you are able to support the CSCA, especially in a year like this where we've had some extra initiatives, extra events, and extra costs associated with them. And so given our 50 years, I thought I'd put out a call for a donation of $50 or more just so that you can support all of these excellent initiatives. Uh, through the CSCA, there's a variety of ways you can donate, which I've numbered here. You can read more about those on the CSCA website. The link is just down there, csca.ca slash support dash CSCA. I actually just put in a donation through Canada Helps, and my oh my, was it easy. It took me one minute. They automatically emailed me my tax receipt. And so I asked you to join me in donating either by Canada Helps or by any of these other methods of donation. And then lastly, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who made this year special. An anniversary year should feel special. And I think this year has felt really special. Um, I know it's felt that way for me. So I just want to say a special thank you to everyone that participated in any of the celebration ac activities and initiatives that I just mentioned, certainly the celebration committee for all of their hard work and their passion. And I want to particularly thank the whole CSEA executive and Arnold Sikama for the guidance that they gave to our committee and the support, um, and Mark McEwen for all of his hard work. Thanks, Mark. I know the newsletter, you put a lot of work into that, and the Q&A with the 50 CSCA members, that's work that you do every week. Um, so we certainly wouldn't be able to celebrate with all of the work that, that you and others have, have put in over the last year and more. So maybe a round of applause for everyone that has helped and participated. A party isn't a party without all of these people that are participating and going to past president lectures or 
being a past president and giving a lecture. So uh, thanks everyone for their hard work celebrating this uh, milestone. So I wanted to pass things off now to my friend, Judy, and Judy will introduce our guest speaker for tonight, John Wood. Here, John and I were at the meeting in Mississauga. Um, uh, that's where that's taken. And we've known each other probably for 30 some years, but our initial meeting is lost in the veils of time somewhere. We think it may be the Seattle Pacific meeting in 1993 even. Well, that's a long time. And because this the theme of this meeting is supposed to be cross-border checkup, it's sort of fitting that John and I are both dual citizens who moved to Canada from the U.S. at one time. We moved to Canada um, and both decided to stay. Um, we're both from very small towns in the United States. John from a town with the very unique name of Cedro Woolley. Cedro means cedar. I looked this up tonight. And I am probably the only person in all of CSCA that has also has had a relative living in Cedro Woolley. So there you go. Um, it's um, the Spanish word for cedar. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful area known as the gateway to the North Cascades along the Skagit River. And John as a child, John said he grew up as a feral child. <laughs> I didn't, I wasn't quite a feral child, but John was a feral child <laughs> investigating the streams and lakes and woods and became enamored with aquatic insects and such. Um, then he completed his master's. Let's see. He completed his master's in um, Ellensburg, Washington on Canis flies. Now, in case you don't know where Ellensburg is, that's also in northern Washington, a bit east of Seattle. And um, I also have relatives there, by the way. But anyway, um, then he did his continuing with the Canis fly theme. He did his PhD on Cadiz flies at the University of California at Berkeley, and uh, that resulted in several publications on that insect. So John and his wife Kathy moved to Canada in 1989, whereas I moved in 1970. See, I'm I'm actually older than he is. Uh, <laughs> he became uh, in 1989 assistant professor at King's University and has a daughter and her family living in Sherwood Park near Edmonton and a son living in the Yukon. And yeah, we like exploring Canada. Technically, John is an insect ecologist with specialties in population and aquatic and evolutionary ecology, but his teachings and publications range rather widely. He's taught ecology invertebrate zoology, limnology, conservation biology, ethology, environmental science, and some non-majors courses in physical geography, and even a course titled Insects and Humanity. That's way more variety of courses than I've ever taught. In addition to King's, he's taught in Belize and at the Osabo Institute in Michigan. Most recently, he was Dean of Faculty, Dean of the Faculty of Natural Sciences and Director of the Environmental Studies Program. And so he stayed at um, King's University ever since 1989. Many of John's publications have been authored with other CSCA members, um, and ASA members too, including Heather Loy, Harry Spalling, Harry Cook, who you see there, at the end of the table um, at King's, David Clements and Karen Steensma at Trinity Western, and also Steve Belma Pettiger, ASA. Heather Loy and John did some very clever work on discuss hospitality and the imagination about edible insects and people who consume edible insects. They even managed in this course to coax their undergraduates to try delicacies made of various insects. 
And I still remember seeing rather gross, uh, talk about disgust, photos of mealworm larvae on crackers. I don't know how you ever got people to eat that, John. With the students at King's, he also did 25 years of research on population and um, behavioral studies on the urban white-tailed jackrabbits in Edmonton. Um, and now in retirement, he is speaking on our understanding. Oh, that was too fast. Speaking on our understanding of physical death uh, and, and in the academic discourse of science. <laughs> I didn't mean to pull that up just yet. <laughs> and and traditionally, uh, attitudes towards death in the church. He's done an amazing amount of, of administration over the years for various Christian higher education organizations, including development of um, national accreditation pr program, for undergraduate environmental science and environmental studies programs. This involved being on the leadership team of the National Committee of Environmental Program Directors, together with Environmental Careers Organization of Canada, the, in, the Environmental Careers Organization of Canada, which is a premier organization <laughs> for employment, certification, development, program accreditation body in North America. For this week he did for this work he did a lot of program reviews at several universities across Canada uh, and even three at Trinity Western as well. John was also academic dean for the Osabo Institute for Environmental Studies for several years. Osabo educates undergraduates. Probably most of you are familiar with the Osabo Institute uh, in Michigan. Um, I pass by it when I go to visit my son sometimes, and um, it's a field studies. It trains students in field studies in the in environmental um, setting. And he's also presented in a variety of venues there. This is from Gordon College annual meeting in 2018. We had a lobster bake, ha, and that was pretty good. So um, this is proof that John and I have actually known each other, well, at least since um, 2018, this, this um, conference. Something else that John and I have in common is that we both participated in the early 1990s in the Research and Training for Reform joint program of the Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada and the Government of Canada. I think John doesn't even know that I participated in this as well. Um, this was a pro program to introduce colleagues from former Soviet states to Canadian mm -hmm. education, and it allowed us to um, invite um, professors from other universities to visit our universities for, uh, I had people come for like three months, and um, this introduced them to the gospel as well as to how, from the government's perspective, how we train people in democratic countries in um, in teaching. So it was a great way to promote the gospel among Soviet professors. And John, I turn this over to you now. Thank you, Judy, for that uh, introduction. Uh, we share so many things going back and forth, and it's really fitting for not uh, tonight uh, in our conversation. Um, it, it, this is a cross-border checkup and a conversation about our relationships between the United States and Canada, and Judy and I have walked that, as you've heard, um, you know, for a long while. But we're also uh, not just cross-border from, uh, Judy, you've just reminded me, not just cross-border to the U.S., but we also have these very interesting international connections that the CSCA and the ASA have made over the years. Uh, the particular program that you were in, and uh, Judy, we actually invited, I had two professors come at different years and spend six weeks at King's. I just want to tell that little story to start because this is currently anecdotal and maybe I'll put you to sleep like I was in the chair there. But um, it was very interesting and it's related to our work in the CSCA and ASA. 
I had a professor come in. She flew in on late Sunday night, picked her up at the airport to her room, gave her some material on Kings, and she came downstairs in the morning into my office where I was giving her an introduction to Kings. And we're just talking together. I'm not sure if a, I had a phone call or something distracted me. And she was over at my bookshelf, looking at the bookshelf. And, and as I finished up with the student or the call, we turned back together and she goes, this is uh, Natasha. Um, and she goes, very interesting that God has led me to this place. And I said, well, good. And then we went on, did the tour and the rest. And that began about, uh, I don't remember, a one or two day dance between the two of us, figuring out that we were both believers. She from an Orthodox background and has a wonderful expressive faith. And that became a rich experience. I had a chance to go and spend three weeks in their community and see the expression of a certain kind of American evangelicalism and witness into their community, and then talk with these people because the community she lived in was uh, something like three quarters of the people had masters or PhDs. It was a, a one of those intellectual cities that the Russians concentrated and built uh, for the purposes of nuclear power development. And we had a remarkable time and experience and you see how God reaches out through our colleagues, through our professional experience. I think, Judy, you're going to see this theme come back this evening as I do a CSCA ASA cross-border checkup. As I said, apologies to Ian Hannah Mansing and the, C uh, the CBC. Uh, and for our American guests, if you haven't tuned in on a Sunday afternoon to listen to he, uh, Ian, and he poses a question. And there's call-ins from all across the country. They start with some expertise. That's what you're going to have tonight. And then it will go to the Q&A. So for our U.S. friends and for our students in the uh, watch parties tonight, pay attention. There are going to be questions coming up at the end, and you'll be invited uh, to participate then. You know, anniversaries like this are really important. The CSCA obviously, in our 50th anniversary. woohoo! I mean, it's 50th anniversaries are great. The ASA blew through its 75th and had a huge celebration in 2016. And that was an tra important transition year. And, that, and these are times in which you look back and you look ahead. And there are, there are times for reflection. So I'm going to use my experience and tell a personal story. And I want to use that as a way to talk about what it is we do in our mission in the ASA and the CSCA. So I hope you'll find this interesting. If you don't, you can just pick up a coffee and rest because we're not in person and I won't even notice. All right. Well, my journey really has some interesting twists and turns. The 25th anniversary of the ASA took place at North Park then college, now university, in Chicago in 1966. Jim Kennedy, E. James Kennedy, was an ASA member, along with Ralph Lowell. They were two of the three bio or four biology professors at North Park at the time. And we baby boomers had just swooped in. 19 Class of 1965 completely blew the walls out of everything. We were just it was so fun. You were down in the basement of old buildings doing biology labs with, and, and these guys, you could just feel the energy in these professors that had been around for eight or 10 years at North Park. And then here comes the ASA on campus. I didn't know it at the time, but when I took the course with Ralph Lowell and some with, with uh, Jim, but when I took a course with Ralph called phylogenetic theory, I thought, wow, this is great. That's a course on evolution. Now, at the time, 1967, you couldn't put evolution in the, the college catalog or calendar. I mean, that would create all kinds of problems. But we were introduced literally to evolutionary theory, and it was a theoretical course. Remarkable. I still draw from what I learned in that course, life lessons. And so 
North Park, my profs there were enormously helpful as mentors to me. And at the end of that experience, uh, the department chair, Jim Kennedy, gave me a student membership for one year to ASA. Now, that turned out to be important because uh, it was actually, I was a, um, how do you cram four years into six, kind of seven or eight or nine? I took a little hiatus in 1969. I should have graduated, but I actually did a number of other things because that was a period of, of turmoil, not unlike the one we're in today. It was institutional turmoil, but it was social and political turmoil. The turn this was a period of civil rights. It was the period of Vietnam. It was the emergence of the environmental movement. All of those things were happening. And I actually took time out, worked for a gr social group with men in prison, and actually um, uh, some very interesting administrative work with that group. And that turned out to be... Uh, a really interesting detour because over on the right here in 1972, you'll see my blushing young bride. She's a beautiful lady. She's the one with the shorter hair. Okay. <laughs> and I had shoulder length hair then, but in 1947, Zeta, that's my mom on Mount Fujiyama, um, she also had a little child, and for the first two years of my life, they didn't cut my hair. And I had long, even longer, curlier hair at that time. So I guess I started a hippie, and now I'm just an old hippie, you know, classic, classic boomer. My partner in life has been really vital to my success in my career. Uh, we come out of that generation where where wives, uh, if they didn't, often would set aside their their professional uh, aspirations to make sure that the the guy got ahead in what he was doing. That just sort of fell out naturally for us, and we've navigated that our entire career. But I just want to say how thankful I am to Kathy for making it possible. Judy, you mentioned all the different things that I did. That travel, that that work, all beyond the five days a week that you teach in a university, that all happened because of her. And we love the outdoors. We started there. We still get out from time to time. We're a little slower. And we did celebrate an anniversary, too, and take stock of our relationship. It was the milestone. Uh, back here just in January of 2022. And look, I still think I have almost a longer hair <laughs> on the left. Hmm. These were interesting days and uh, just rich times there. So I want to ask us it, to come back to, I've got this ASA, but you can put CSCA in there. What is your lineage? What's your heritage? How is it that you came to be where you are? Or if you're a student here this evening, how is it that that uh, it, who's influencing you now in your undergraduate days? My genealogy involves several different individuals, and some of them are are known to our community. The last two, Walt Hearn and Bernard Ram. The first one on the list was my pastor, Worth Hodgson. In my high school years. He pulled me aside one day, and he saw a promise where I'm not sure I did, but he said to me, John, we need men like you in the ministry. That was an important moment. And as I mentioned in the, I think in the abstract or perhaps in the Q&A piece that I put in, I, I mentioned that Worth not only said something about my potential. Um, it was a re I was really a rough diamond. Let me tell you. <laughs> I can't believe that he saw things, but he did. But he not only saw the potential and named it, but then he went further and helped me fund. Because when I went home to my dad, I said, Dad, I want to go to North Park College in Chicago. 
And um, he said, well, that's interesting. How much does it cost? <laughs> Private Christian education. It cost as much in 1965 as our tuition at King's did in 1990 when I came. Um, and Dad looked at me and said, I'm sorry. That's just not in the cards for us. About three days later, we were at dinner, and Dad said after dinner, about that college, the president called. I think you can go. So that's how pastors can be transformational in the lives of young people and set a career trajectory. He didn't know, and I didn't know what God was calling me to, but he knew I was being called. How many of you are being called that God is speaking to you? And what the ASA and CSA do, do together is make that possible. And our mission to bring science and the church together the important way of mobilizing pastors. I'm looking at Bob Geddes in the corner here. You're on the screen, Bob. And I'm thinking about pastors and the role that pastors have in shaping the lives of the next generation of scientists in the social and natural sciences, our wheelhouse. And this is a transformational moment in history for us. We know from the surveys that are being done in our own experience that young people are having a struggle with the church and with their futures and with a career and coming out of a pandemic, it's a really important time for us to be giving a sense of hope and a sense of call. And so I love that about CSCA and ASA because that's been my experience uh, throughout my career. Walt Hearn, many of you know, W-O-E, woe is me, the weary old editor. He was our newsletter editor for many years. When I got to Berkeley in the 19, late 1970s for my PhD work, the uh, first person I called up was Walt. And he didn't let me sit in those days. He said, oh, John, we have local chapters here. I know speakers and I know people who can give us a venue. Do you think you could arrange a meeting? And so I essentially became the local chapters uh, organizer in the Bay Area. And that, again, is mentorship. And then Bernard Ram, uh, we'll know him as the, the premier academic theologian that was in the ASA for so many years, and his, his work and his books uh, have been so influential. In fact, I still see master's and PhD theses that cite him in theology, and they cite his work and it's it's still alive, and that speaks volumes. Um, my claim to fame about Bernard Ram is that he called me out one night in a Q and A time, <laughs> and I I was saying, you know, come on, let's get going here, let's get some action, and he basically said, just take it easy, young man. There have been many here before you. There'll be many after you. Change is happening, and I went, oh, okay. It was a valuable lesson to have patience. And something about our anniversaries is we look back and say, oh, have patience. As the, hmm, what was that little kid's song? Have patience, have patience, don't be in such a hurry. Oh, when you get impatient, you only start to worry. Oh, that's a lovely tune. Well, my vocational calling, the specific thing is that I finally learned that I was a teacher. I got into undergraduate days and, you know, you're trying to do this. Is it the EPA, which is just emerging? Is it medicine, which where my some of my colleagues uh, went and had marvelous careers in medicine? Um, glad I didn't do that. My major prophet, Berkeley, who, who was an, an aquatic entomologist, said to me, oh, he started in med school right out of a philosophy degree. And he said after that, he said, oh, I was the first semester in med school, and I realized I was going to spend my entire career looking at the naked backsides of old people. So I didn't think I wanted to do that. So, so he, went to, he went off to a master's degree in fisheries and then to a PhD in aquatic entomology working on 
caddis flies, Judy, on caddis flies, sponge-eating caddis flies, this strange, exotic insect. I mean, what a dead-end career. Pick caddis flies, and you're going nowhere. Interestingly, Vince was at Berkeley, and from that platform was invited by the United Nations to go to West Africa first to do the ecology of stream insects, so that they could use some treatments there, some ecological procedures that would Im improve the, uh, would remove the number of black flies, reducing the transmission of onchocerasis, river blindness from a nematode. He subsequently went to, with the United Nations uh, just a few years ago in the early 2000s into Cambodia and Vietnam. On the, in the Mekong Delta, and did similar kinds of work. In his career, as a doctor, he would have interacted with thousands, maybe tens of thousands of patients, and done good as a doctor. He got redirected, and, and I know from having talk and talked to him over the years, by God's hand, he got redirected into working on aquatic insects, he has impacted the lives of millions of people for good. You just never know. So the important thing is to ask and to discern, where are you going? And who are you following? Well, I love teaching. I love talking. You probably see me already. I'm waving my hands as I'm sitting here. I can't. You know, it was, I followed Billy Graham. They had to tie him. He was a youth for Christ, and he would go back and forth across the stage. Then they put a television in front of him. They almost had to tie him to the podium to keep him in front of the TV. All right, I will try. But um, it's, it's remarkable how your personality comes through in, when you're in front of an audience. And um, I have found myself teaching and pointing, oh, by the way, that's probably a donut. I'm now looking at it, actually a donut in my hand. As my dad used to say, we, that's the army Jeep, I think, that we were on. Maybe it's a different military truck. He was in the United States Army and part of the occupation of, of Japan. And he used to say we would go down to, and get donuts, and we'd come home with a dog between he and I in the front seat. And the dog would take a bite of the donut, I'd take a bite. The dog take a bite, I'd take a bite. It was great. And so he's, it seems like those motions stick with you. Now, here is a part of my journey I want to zero in on for CSCA. It starts really in the 1990s. In the early part of my time, from 1989 to 19, uh, 1999, roughly, I'm not really going to that many ASA meetings and not really connected with CSCA much. I did in 1998, I think, responded to um, Howard Van Til when he was on a speaking tour through Canada. He was at the University of Alberta, and I was responded uh, to him on that. But it was in 2004 that things really kind of kicked off uh, with a meeting at Trinity Western. And you see some people here. This is Bud Bauma, and Bud and I subsequently, and actually, pardon me, not subsequently, we had already been uh, co-chairs of commissions in those years, uh, working on, I was working on the Environment Commission, and he was working on the Bioethics Commission. And we were proposing joint symposia to increase the um, power at the meetings to bring speakers in and to help populate. And so I can speak. I mean, Arnold, I'm looking at Arnold, and I'm looking at this entire wonderful team that brought off the meeting last year. Uh, Robert Mann was, and Janet Warren were the co-chairs. Marvelous meeting pulled off. But we all know if we've been involved with those, it takes what? Lots of other members doing things to bring quality speakers and quality papers in. So Bud and I would do that intentionally. Bud was rich. I speak of him in the past tense. He sadly and rather suddenly passed away. A marvelous public intellectual, 
speaking into the questions of bioethics um, right across the country, and his voice is still being heard uh, through his publications and work. And of course, next to him is my colleague, Heather Loy, who uh, has been mentioned, and Heather and I have a long publishing career together. And here she was, a keynote speaker for us, dealing with the subject of personality, which is her centerpiece research. And then on the right, of course, new ideas come out of ASA and CSCA meetings. And at that meeting, in the middle here is uh, is David Cucci, right next to David Clements. And David was part of a team. And over on the right is Janelle Curry, our current ASA president. Hi, Janelle. And uh, we all looked younger in those days. I know. And it's just wonderful that we're not changing. I, I know. I just saw Janelle a, a few months ago, and she has hardly aged a day. I think she's going to turn 40 next week. but. We'll have to ask her about that afterwards. However, at this time, out of this meeting, and Dorothy Boris is there, Dave Warners is in the background, this is a team of people who had met at Calvin for a summer symposium. For three weeks, we were together. That entire team brought that work to the CSCA conference, as I think we had two streams that went, and presented those papers in those streams. And Janelle and Dave were talking as those presentations. They said, you know, we should put a book out on this. And you'll see there in the lower right-hand corner, the result two years later of a, a book influencing the church through a series of focused lessons. So the CSCA has been really remarkable. Some, that same year with Templeton money, the uh, ASA and CSCA brought uh, George Ellis. It was a for this meeting and a related meeting that was held uh, there in Vancouver. And then George Ellis went across the country, and I was privileged to be his host when he was in Edmonton and got the chance to go to the University of Alberta, where um, George Ellis, who is a, a, a world-famous cosmologist, um, was doing some work with Don Page, a, a, a Baptist cosmologist, and a Baptist believer and a remarkable man in his own right. And those two got together and said, hey, let's have a departmental seminar. Now, especially for the students, but for the rest of us, because we are an interdisciplinary society, I sat down that in that seminar, and there were only about 25 people in the room, and they were masters and PhD and postdocs and faculty. And George goes forth, he's got an hour and a half. I don't have that long, but uh, he had an hour and a half. I think I was with him. I know I was with him for the first 10 minutes of that talk. I knew what he was talking about. Like In the next 30 to 40 minutes, I knew what he was talking about in a general way, but I didn't. And by the time he summed it up, I knew. Yeah, I knew what he was talking about. And then the Q&A started with the postdocs and the masters and the faculty. And whew, I was clueless about what they were talking about. And that is an illustration and was for me a rich illustration of the academy. What happens in the academy is that you're able and privileged to go deep, very, very deep into complex esoteric topics. And that needs then to be translated. Even if you have a PhD from Berkeley, you don't understand it. And then subsequently to that, I talked, I heard Robert Mann say just not recently, uh, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you're, I don't know what he said, you're ignorant or a fool. You don't know what you're talking about. Nobody understands quantum mechanics. I go, oh, okay. <laughs> Cosmology, uh, yeah. But we have some remarkable people like Robert Mann. And like um, uh, Jennifer Wiseman, who works on the Hubble telescope. And these folks translate that not only for us in CSCA and ASA professionally, but also for the church. And that's our role and it's our mission. Well, my continuing journey, well, it goes on. We're seeing new parts of the creation. Bob Geddes has been a marvelous. This is Crawford Lake. If you missed that field trip, Two weeks before we were there this summer, 
the Anthropocene, the Ge Geological Society, the International Geological Societies declared the Anthropocene Golden Spike would be Crawford Lake, just up the road from us. What a moment! I was asking Bob, we think it might be in the 19th century the last time a geologic epoch had been named, a new one. And it's a golden spike. Now, you don't put a spike in a lake. Um, but in geology, they put they find the place where the rock layers change, and they physically mark it, and that's the place. Bob, thank you so much for showing us that. And that's typical of what ASA and CSA are about. And it's probably one of the richest benefits, well, not the richest, but it's a great benefit to have that kind of expertise. My buddy Hank Bessman, and you've heard Harry Cook referred to it in the his picture. We were the three amigos in the biology department. And it's very rare in your career you get the opportunity to establish an entire department and and raise it up across a, you know three decades of work and see the alumni come out of that. It was absolutely marvelous. And he and I still have chance, as we did a week ago, to just sit and talk like old guys do. And of course, the Canadian US, US thing, I couldn't pass by without poking Michael Everest a little bit. We had him in Mississauga there, and I pointed out those two towers. I said, you know what those are? And he goes, oh, I don't know what they are. And I said, well, that's Marilyn, and there's Joe next to her. And he goes, huh? <laughs> that's an inside joke in Mississauga. In when what back in 2006, they had a contest to uh, design those towers as a marquee for the city because it's been eaten up in the greater Toronto uh, region as a marquee feature of the city and also to give it a name. And it has some technical name, but very quickly it got the nickname hey, that's the Maryland Monroe Tower. That's Maryland. If you need to know, on the right is Marilyn, on the left is Joe. I think that's correct, right? Or am I wrong? Maybe not. Maybe it's the other way around. I don't know. Okay. Now I'm going to want to turn to something a little more serious, and I think it's very characteristic of who we are. And I'm going to, sorry, I have to open my timer so I don't go wildly over time. Um <laughs> I want to turn now to something I think is really serious and, and, a, and a way to think about ourselves. Professional formation is vital to all of us. That, it has been vital to us, and it is to those emerging scholars. And my colleague and friend, Fred Van Dyke, back in the late 1980s, um, came to King's and gave a talk I've actually got this as 89, it was 98, I'm sorry, I inverted the date there, uh, in 1998, at what we call the first um, conference of Christian environmental professionals. He had no way for Christians in the environment profession to get together. Um, and so we got to talking about what is it to be a professional? And that's what we asked Fred to speak on as a keynote. And he gave us this five part. Um, taxonomy that I want to use tonight to help us understand, first of all, we're professionals. Fred, in his own work, published numerous books, but in, this is the third edition of a textbook in conservation biology. And textbooks are powerful ways to shape and express your professional competency. But all of us do that, whether we're in engineering, we work in the government, we're in medicine or industry. Every day, what, our, what we get paid for, what we're employed to do, and what people count on us is to be professionally competent. Excellence there is the metric, as it was at Berkeley when I got there. I, if I never understood it before in my education, when I got to Berkeley and a PhD, I realized this is a meritocracy. They don't care what you think about anything except the science ideas you're working on. And that turned out to be an, an extremely important uh, shaping experience to recognize that we are professionals 
um, yeah, I, much more can be said about this. But I think of our engineering. I, Bill Jordan, been our at the ASA was our our past uh, president, and Bill's work in engineering. And I always think, yeah, bridges have to stand up. Airplanes do not fall out of the sky. And that, thank you, that's God's blessing through engineering standards. Bill professionally has risen to the point where he is on the national ABET, the National Accrediting Board for Engineering and Technology Programs across the United States, helping to set the standards and approve engineering training and teaching, shaping the next generation of engineers. That's what Christians do. And that is not often heard about. Well, we're also colleagues, and we're colleagues in so many remarkable ways. And I just want to focus on um, our student focus, because the Emerging Scholars Network that you know about has been our focus, especially for nearly a decade now in the ASA and at our meetings, and that's terribly important. And we have student scholarships, and as I said, I had a student membership back in 1974, right? And, and Coming out of the 60s, we saw that as an organization. But even back in 1948, one of the first things that the ASA did in those early years was Modern Science and Christian Faith. This was a publication of about 3,000 copies distributed in the United States expressly for students. This has been followed up in 1984, 86 with a publication on how to teach evolution. Uh, and and do it in a respectful way. And we've always had a passion for students, for teaching, for education, for we are an educational. So that's being a colleague to people. That's being responsible. But it's also being a colleague and doing what, what Judy, Bob, I'm seeing you in front of me, what Hank Bestman, Harry Cook, Heather Loy, uh, Janelle, all sorts of other people. I could just keep naming all of these folks that have been colleagues and caring for one another. In the workplace, what makes us stand out is that we care. The scriptures say, my, you know, that's love. The early Christians were known in the midst of Roman pandemic and plague for what? They ran to the people in trouble. They ran to the babies that were dying. They were colleagues. They sh showed care and expressed that. Well, a colleague also involves uh, organizational structures. So building partnerships and creating opportunities for networking is a vital piece of what the CSCA and ASA does. And that's being a colleague. That's being a colleague to our friends and those that are called and gifted to work in other areas. And it's terribly important, and that's why we don't take positions on issues, and we welcome all kinds of folks into our community. And um, is it stressful? You bet. I think it might have been stressful for those early Christians that ran into pandemic situations, in the plague situation. I know it has been throughout the history of the church. It's always stressful, but it is what we're called and gifted to do. Fred has worked at the Asabal Institute as a colleague and mentor, and he's also worked with the Young Evangelicals for Climate Change and other things that he's done. And, and then being a bridge. Our mission is to science and the church. In our very mission, we are a bridge organization structurally. And now how can I do that? I start thinking about each day, how can we be a bridge in our executive meetings, in our local chapter meetings? How are we being a bridge? And what are we doing to reach science and the church? And I can tell you, Judy, thank you for, for remembering that Universities Canada program. That came on my desk as a letter. I set it on my desk instead of throwing it in the recycle. <laughs> It was my first reason. They want me to do something. Oh, yeah, I've got all kinds of time to do stuff. And I set it on my desk and said, I'm going to pray about this. I've got to think about it. This is usually what I say. And I went away for a day. You know, I came back and thought, 
you know, this is an opportunity to meet a colleague from Russia, but it's also an opportunity for me to learn something and to, and to engage with people I never engage with any other way. Uh, I think I can, uh, I have a loving wife who's really generous. I think I can do this thing. And that turned out to be such a rich experience. I'm still in touch with Natasha, although not in the midst of the current crisis. And we, but I have learned about the church and learned things internationally from her that I could never have learned. And it's remarkable. And then a witness. Well, we think of ourselves witnessing because we, ASA, CSEA grew out of largely evangelical roots. We were birthed out of the evangelical move of the 1940s and that's our sort of our ethos and so immediately we start thinking of individual it's have i done the four spiritual laws have i done the i found it campaign or whatever the latest evangelistic that's not what this is really talking about professionally in terms of professions it's part of our affiliation groups each of these affiliates the the pastors and philosophers and historians group the the Christian geologists, the Christian biologists, the uh, CWIS itself, and all of these affiliate groups are just a small number. The last time I looked, there were 70 or 80 Christians in groups. That is groups of Christians, named, identified groups. You can find them on the web for 70 or 80 different professions. Doctors, dentists, well-known, Christian nurses, the oldest of these affiliate groups is the Christian Nursing Association. It goes back into the 1930s. Christians have reached out professionally to connect with one another. And whatever profession you're in, whatever professional society you participate in, we can help. And the affiliate groups are there. And, and Dana Oleskowitz is charged as a staff. So we put staffing to this to help see that they thrive. Because if they do, then our witness goes out. And so it's not only that, but it's also our institutional mission. Uh, Arnold has seen this. I know uh, Vicki and Janelle have seen it. Randy has seen it. I have. Is that we are identified as a, a religious educational organization. We're seen out there. And, in, and we're identified. And we're in partnership with other groups. It's not the closest partnership, but it is in partnership from our institutional position. And we are a partner, for instance, with Dozier, okay, which is a, a federally funded program in the United States, explicitly reaching out to seminaries. I need to shout out on this one to, uh, to Matthew Morrison at uh, Ambrose down in Calgary. Matthew uh, is working with Beth Stovall in the seminary there on the Dozier ground. You can get a science and seminaries grant here in Canada if you're affiliated with a seminary. What a great opportunity and way to reach out and extend that. All right, I'm preaching to the choir, but it's such a great story we have to tell. And we are all literally public intellectuals. Now, not all of us are Catherine. Catherine Hayhoe is known Inf famous and infamous, pardon me, worldwide. I she's a, what stature? I just saw her on on uh, on CBC. No, Amanpour and Company on PBS two three nights ago, talking and, and explaining because we just had a major report. It's been the last five or six years. A report came out in the United States on a uh, climate report and how we're doing, and who do they go to? They go to a fellow of the ASA. That's who they go to. Well, you can think about, by the way, I'm, I'm looking there, Arnold, with you and Mark back at the, what, at the Sky Gala, right? The Sky to Sea, the Sea or Sky or whatever that was in 2018, 20, when that meeting was. And she was a keynote speaker. And there were other things that happened in that. Oh, man, so many different stories to tell. But I want to stick on the public intellectual side. Because Catherine is one. Francis Collins comes to mind as another well-known 
public intellectual. And there are others. Jennifer Wiseman, I think, comes, but Jennifer is probably not as well known out there as others. Not a household name. And most of us on the screen tonight are not household names. But I can tell you that we are looked to as authorities. And we have something to share. And that's an opportunity to be an advocate for God's good creation. All of the ways that he has gifted, the, the laws of physics, the intricacies of chemistry, how our social dynamics work. I love Heather Loy's work. I love Aaron Smith's insight. April Codero. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of, and this goes back throughout our history. Um, I think it's David Mobert just passed away. We have long time members in the social sciences who have had deep impacts in our, in our culture for good. And we are capable of doing so much. So we're professionals, we're colleagues, we're bridges and witnesses, and we are creation's advocate. And you know, you really don't have to do much explicitly. I remember being at Berkeley, and my one of my, oh, I was a prof, I was his TA, and one day, we're in, the, in his office, preparing for the lab on Monday, and he stops mid-sentence almost, just turns to me and said, John, I don't understand. I have all these undergraduate students coming into my class and they're trying to save me. What's going on? <laughs> he says, I'm a Christian. I go to church. I, I, well, that was the first time that it hit me and I was kind of fumbling around for things. Not too long after that, we're walking in with a lab mate of mine. Two of us are walking down the street after lunch in Berkeley and there was a, a street Christian guy starts witnessing right you know, right in our face, like, you know, I don't know what he said, Jesus something, and he just was in his feel. And Steve, my buddy, just kind of, we both stopped, and Steve went, kind of put his hands up and says, I'm with him. <laughs> and he's pointing to me. <laughs> and I said, it's all right. I'm a believer. I, I, you know, Lord bless you on your work, you, what you do. And the guy just like, oh, you know. <laughs> and then we went on, told him thanks, and went down the street. We got down the street a little ways. And I said, you know, Steve, being with me is doesn't really count. <laughs> and it was something like, oh. And then he kind of thought about that. And then a little while later, he said to me, what do they do at church? I know you go. What does the pastor do? Does he reads the scripture and then he talks about it? And here is a colleague at a premier university of the world. Who's a heathen? He doesn't know. He knows he's ignorant of the most basic information that underlies our entire culture and history and why science is here and we do what we do. We have an opportunity that just keeps coming at us all the time. Well, I'll go through this reasonably quickly. Because I want to get at our strategic vision. I think one of the most important things that came out of our anniversary and the crisis of the pandemic was a refocusing on our mission and a, um, a visualization of what it is we do. And this very helpful model came out from, um, many of you will know, the Praxis organization and Andy Crouch. Uh, he was most famous of the people who works in Praxis, working with young people a kind of tripartite, three-part, redemptive nonprofit model. And this is based on that with three parts of strategic vision, leadership intent, and business model. And I have been through this in the past, and we won't do much with this. But the real question that came out of the team, and I love this, um, Janelle, we you were at the table as a board member and now as the leader of the organization, you know that we were talking a strategic plan for the next uh, three to five years to get us through to 2025. By the way, in 2020, we were all trying to figure out how do we do that? How do we survive the next three to five years? 
and that's our strategic plan. But the real question is, what's the ASA going to look like in our centenary? I want to be there. Somebody may have to bring me in a wheelchair if it happens. I think I'll be, what, 96 or something like that. <laughs> Walt Hearn made it a long time, and a, a number of other, well, who knows, might happen. But that's our goal. What is the CSCA going to look like at 75? What's it going to look like at 100? These are cultural institutions. They are middle institutions, they're called. They're not government. They're not science, they're not educational institutions, and they're not families. They are institutions that stand between, and they're vital to the common good in our culture. So why does the ASA exist? Well, we exist in our mission to engage science in the church, and there are lots of detail on Our vision is to, in Empower our members to do what God has called and gifted them to do. I showed you a little of that in my earlier part. That's my life story. That's where that kind of thing comes from. And I've heard that story from member after member again and again, is that, that we need a vision, not for the CSCA or ASA to be doing all of these things, but to empower and engage our members so that they do it. It's like the cell in a body. A single cell can't do everything. Even a little collection of cells can't do everything. But interacting with, informing, empowering others and being a vital part of that bigger body allows the entire body to function and to thrive, to flourish, and to do good. That's our vision and our values as we've been finding and emphasizing, and we saw it so much at the meeting this summer, is one of humility and others. But we value the creeds of the church, the history of the church, and our Christian faith. We value good science, normal science, um, and others. So what do we do? Well, we serve our members over on our leadership intent in scholarship and professional development formation and in community. So we serve with dialogue and discovery, our journals, God and nature, as well as perspectives in professional and faith formation together and walking together as a Christian community. But to do that, we've got to have a sound business model. We won't succeed unless we do this third vector what is our plan that has been building the team and csca and asa have both been building a professional team and i love the teams that we have it involves being intentional about career and calling that's why we have a career center and we have emphasized career development and formation building that next generation and it also involves integrity, and our identity. Any organization that gets to be 80 years old is going to make mistakes. We're in a controversial area. We have lots of interaction. We have difference of opinion. We are going to offend one another and other people. And that has happened to us, and we have navigated that by God's grace. And we will continue to navigate that. But not by shying away when you when you have identity and integrity issues, but by responding to them. And then I've always said, we are a member of uh, ECFA in the U.S. That And Rebecca, you talked about uh, going to, um, I have to remind me, the uh, Donations Canada. It's not Donations Canada. It's, um, I can almost say it, but I'm an old guy. <laughs> Canada Helps, yeah. Canada Helps. That's a way to ensure our donors that we are an organization of integrity. Thank you. That's one of the ways that we do that. And then we report out every year. So these are important things, not just our scientific and our integrity about believers, but our integrity in our operations are not just ethical, but redemptive in what we do. 
And then we've had all kinds of change throughout the pandemic. And you're familiar with, with most of this. The summer something has been mentioned. Uh, Vicki is probably smiling because we were sitting there going, now what do we do? <laughs> it's like, ah! And uh, summer something came up and we finally came back. And now we have these wonderful online expressions. That was one of the things that Randy Isaac had said we need to do, fully enter the digital world. And we have been stepping into that professionally. Uh, Mark McEwen's role with us in helping us to do that and build that capacity. And then we came up with uh, the notion of diving deeper, which has been really successful ways to bring the authors in and expand on those articles, really uh, meets a very important need. We're revisioning the brown bag. If you have a name, send us a name. Brown bag lunch somehow just seems like, <laughs> That's like what's on the menu? I don't know. But I'm revisioning that. But thinking about what it was, was professional. Looking at people's career and calling and gifting and having them talk about that. Not their scholarship, but their practice, what they actually do. And then our wildly successful winter symposium series. And here is a way that we've been able to reach the church. In the Phil Yancey event, a pastor friend of mine out in Manitoba sent me a note, said, ah, oh, we had a watch party. Had about 25 people there, including, and he mentioned a national leader of an organization who was at that watch party to hear, not the CSCA, not to hear the ASA. He didn't want to hear about some science thing, but he wanted to hear Phil Yancey speaking in that way. You know, the same Walter Kim, National Association. And now this winter, I think Elaine Eklund, not a public name, but in terms of the social sciences, a powerful voice and researcher in the area of faith and science. So I want to acknowledge our teams and what they, you guys have done. Thank you from me and all of us as members, your day-to-day -day efforts make it happen. And this team is mostly paid professionals, and this team is mostly wannabe paid professionals. <laughs> I mean, it's mostly volunteers. And at the scale of this of CSCA, just over 200 members and about 75 followers, so just under 300 total across Canada, we can't afford to do more than be volunteers. But CSEA has taken an important step forward, intentionally opening up an endowment now, a legacy for the future, and building on that, building capacity to have a greater reach. I look at the folks in, on the right here. I know so many of you so well, and I, I know your gifts, your passions, and what you've done. I'm just so thankful for you, and we pray God's blessing. If you're going to make it happen, Captain. There are a few others around there. I'm just going to pick on a, on a couple of new board members in the ASA. Thank them for their service. Catherine Applegate is an educator. She's worked with Biologos to develop a very important curriculum series for homeschools and Christian schools. Um, it's called Integrate. If you don't know about it, you might want to go and see that. Um, Bob Geddes is here in his natural habitat uh, out in the field and is, is the newest uh, I think, ASA board member. That has been a tradition. Judy and I were on the board of the ASA together at a critical, important time, 2016 to 2022, 23. And um, it's just great. We have an integral relationship. What is the CSCA to the ASA? I think the phrase we came up with, Arnold, was the CSCA is the expression of the ASA in Canada. We're integral organizations. We share missions, faith, and science beliefs and work closely together and, and supporting one another so that we can reach um, this generation that's coming. What do I think the future? Here's my crystal ball for you. And with this, I'm nearing the end. This is the next to the last slide, okay? <laughs> So here are my issues. This is what I think. By the way, I'm standing with my granddaughter just a few months ago at Clear Lake, Washington, 
Um, just over that hill is Cedar Woolley, but it's Clear Lake. And that's my granddaughter, and that's our family plot there of uh, her relatives and mine. This intergenerational. So I think these generational transitions are going to be important for us. Certainly in membership, we're membership-based organizations. You know, in this generation, membership is not the same as it was for baby boomers like myself and uh, in the boomer generation. So we're going to have to navigate that. Evolution and climate change as issues will continue to be with us. And as much as that has really settled out and the dynamic there has changed, for instance, in evolution, the conversation has changed in the theological world, in, in the, the books that are being published. Um, Catherine Applegate has published a, her own story of, of journey from doubt about evolution to now being on the, the staff at Biologos and in embracing that theoretical framing for educational purposes. And on climate change, Catherine Hayhoe has, has, she's done that and so many of us have. I had a the cover issue of Faith Today in 2008 in January was a polar bear on a ice block, a very uncomfortable polar bear. That was cover image was to feature a primer on climate change that I and a meteorological colleague wrote together. The letters that came in were less than 50-50 uh, for and against, and, and I'll, you can guess which side. <laughs> and they haven't come back to me and asked for a follow-up. I think Faith Today should. I think our membership here in the CSCA should be contributing. If you have a good idea in an area, we should be contributing to that conversation. And I know some of our members have over the years. Then the next thing is that I think big science is really going to be the future. The young people that are here today and in our, our membership are dealing with big science. It is about teams. It's about interdisciplinarity of research. The day when those of us in small colleges, in my case, with a bucket and a net and walking outside to do ecology is, is pretty tough. My 25 years of whitetail jackrabbit population work was done with a handful of students uh, on the evenings in the winter, and I got away with it. I mean, we could do it. Is it is it big science? No, it's not. You can actually do some things that big science can't, but that's the future. And the Templeton Foundations, plural, are funding big science teams. That's where the use a Canadian Gretzky metaphor, that's where the puck is going and you need to skate to it. And we need to have our a representative group skating to these big science teams out of comprehensive universities. And then I think Aboriginal science is, we need to open that up. I have not heard, I, Dave Tom and the Cambridge Roundtables are the only time I think I've heard anybody talking about Aboriginal science in any, in any way. We need to think about that. Canada is well positioned Come on the heels of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We now have a foundation for engaging this conversation. I think we need to do it intentionally. Um, Global Scholars Canada, uh, Peter Skirman's work, has, has been involved with uh, First Nations in terms of global scholars. This is a topic area that we might open up. And um, there are PhDs in this right here at the University of Alberta. So I think we need to we need to pay attention. And then this is my topic, obviously, but physical death. We boomers, just as we blew the doors out of every institution, the grade schools we came into, the high schools we came into, the colleges and universities we came into, demographically, we're blowing the doors out of the mortuaries and the cemeteries. Here we come. And, and we, as you know, have got in the church, have got a kind of fraught relationship because we see physical death only in negative terms. We need to push past that 
and engage. And I want to say I'm pleased with some of my, many of my colleagues, both theologians and other scientists, who are literally picking up this topic and engaging it. We need a conversation here. And the scientists of us have much to contribute here. And we need. That's my list. Heather Pryor, I think, is going to take it from here with a Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Wow, that was quite a journey for us uh, through a history and a vision and um, all kinds of things in between. It was lovely to hear your personal story, John, of, of how you came along and uh, in ways that probably you hadn't foreseen when you started out. And uh, clearly, you saw that as God's leading, and uh, that was so exciting to hear. So thank you very much. Thank you from all of us. I meant to mention how much work John had done on the Memorandum of Understanding with with mm -hmm. uh, between ASA and CSCA and the changes in the bylaws. We had a very, very active and um, productive uh, two years, the time that I was on the executive committee, not because of me, but because of John and, and other leaders. Uh, but that part of my talk got lost in the presenter's notes that I lost as I was fumbling about with the, um, with the online presentation. So I had intended to go through all that, John, and to say how how you really contributed so much to um, our relationship with ASA with that. And so I want to thank you. Yeah, thank you, Judy. That, I really do appreciate that. I have a little plaque on the wall here of appreciation that came from the board. I mean, any board of an executive committee, right, or executive committee, they get what the day-to-day. -day. But I'm looking at my screen at two people, Janelle Curry and mostly Vicki Bass, and there we go, well, I mean, how did we do this? Because <laughs> Judy was almost tag team. I think Janelle came on right as Judy was leaving or just about maybe overlapped a little bit. You know, it's just been a marvelous team of people and um, <clears throat> that has, has made that happen. And as we all know and have said repeatedly, that's been God's blessing on ASA and CSEA, but especially on ASA during the pandemic. We just had a, um, my goodness, Vicki, there were days, right? You know, we walked into the pandemic staring down a deficit. Our cash flow had, had gone uh, negative. It wasn't like we didn't have money in the bank. We have an endowment, a small one at the time. It's like, you know, you can start robbing that. But now you're eating bone. This is like a, an individual starving themselves, right? And I think it was... I don't remember which board member. Vicky and I put together the the real the raw facts, the hard story, and put it in front of the board and said, "Look, you know, we've really been kind of flat." And actually, as one member said, "Oh, across that many years, you're actually declining. You know, inflation, you're actually declining." You know, yeah. And another board member said, "This is alarming. This is alarming." And boy. People just came together when they saw the need. That's what an anniversary or a crisis will do to you. And it has done it to the, certainly for the ASA. And, you know, COVID was a pressure test on every one of our institutions, our families, us individually, on our churches, right across the government. That stress test hit the ASA and it was like, nitrous oxide in the tank of a dragster. I mean, I think we just took off and I'm excited about seeing the future. One of the things that you mentioned, John, was that uh, if I got this right, um, you started out in the ASA with a student membership. Is that Did I get that right? Correct. Um, and I'm curious to know, maybe people on Zoom can put up their hand. How many people started in the ASA or the CSCA with a student membership? I'm a little curious about that. Okay. Because I think um, as your reflections have sort of led us, John, from looking back to looking ahead, uh, mm -hmm. I really don't want to miss the opportunity to say that 
students are our future. And it's great to see the way that people who started out as with student memberships have continued to become leaders and uh, been really blessed by this interaction. And I think someone has mentioned it already, but I, I want to reiterate for anyone who's listening that student memberships are free. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's a, a great way to join and take advantage of the resources that we have uh, for our organization, which is lovely. Nice. Does anyone else have a response or a question for John? Um, yeah, I've got a question. Uh, could you expound a bit more on how the CSA, CSCA and the ASA can influence professional organizations uh, as we come with um, with more um, th- thinking about the divine, uh, which is something that is um, not included in professional organizations. Exactly. Thank you for that. That's a, a that's a very good question. I think this is an emerging area for us. As an org, as organizations, Randall, I don't think we we've, we've been in, in sufficiently intentional about that. It's been an aspiration throughout our our history to have an impact. And if you're going to have, <clears throat> pardon me, an impact on science writ large, it's like having an impact on the church writ large. Most people think of, oh, let's have a speaker. Let's have a speaker of some riveting person who's out there in front. And that'll, but as you know, in whatever professional organization you're in, the action happens in those professional meetings. That's where the standards are set. If you're a, um, if you have a right to title or right to practice as you do in medicine and engineering and many other fields, that all happens in those professional associations. So I mentioned Bill Jordan, for instance, in the Engineering Society. So Bill is a part of ABET, the accrediting board for engineers across the United engineering programs across the United States. Well, Bill is also part of the Christian Engineers affiliate group. And there they are talking specifically about engineering questions and professional formation and issues. The Christian biologists are doing the same kind of thing. Uh, and so th- I th- I think that's the way that we can have the influence uh, because there, as I mentioned, there's so many of these organizations, the Christian, uh, there's a Christian foresters group with the forestry. There's a Christian ecologist group with the ecological society of America. They have a prayer breakfast um, during the annual meeting of the ecological society. They get together and, and they have a prayer breakfast together. It's just marvelous. It's been organized by grad students over the years, and it kind of ebbs and flows. Uh, My colleague Vern Peters at King's uh, knows about this because he's been to some of them. Um, Bob, I think you mentioned to me that uh, the Geological Society, the Christians there actually had a place on the program. It was listed in the program. Now, I wouldn't, that's a, a model that fit. I think societal changes that, you know, you need to do other things. So ASA has come in with this affiliate strategy to help support groups of members and those who aren't ASA members, but who want to join an affiliate. That was a stumbling block in the past is that people said, I don't really want to be part of CSCA or ASA, but I do like being in the professional uh, Christian astronomers and the Christian geologists, Christian biologists. And so we said, we've opened that up and said, look, we're going to provide the uh, administrative support, web page access and development, you know, background. If you collect dues and that, we can do financial help with you. We can give you a place. Now, some of these organizations, the bigger ones, have actually incorporated independently. So the, uh, the Christian Medical and Dental Association, they don't need us. And they don't, they don't need that, nor the vets, nor the nurses. But these many of these other professional areas, then there are hundreds of them, I think, where there are men and women who are believers who, who want to do something that's not particular to the, the professional work. We can do it through an affiliate, and you can be supported, mentored, encouraged. 
And the key thing here, I, Randall, I'm glad you asked this because I'm just remembering the thing that happened at Berkeley. And then again, when I came to, here to Canada and I was over at the University of Alberta, I began to realize it's not the quality of your faith. You're, you know, do you wear a cross or you, you know, a, you virtue signal right in some way? It is your ideas. That's in a meritocracy what people are looking for. And I can tell you, Christians can actually ask great questions, questions that other people don't think about because we are people of the book. We read the stories of history and of transformation. We have the opportunity as Sunday after Sunday to look over the, the maker's shoulder and be schooled by his story, the big story, the grand story. And, you know, philosophers like Charles Taylor and many other cultural, and you'll hear it from Elaine Eklund and many other cultural commentators say, wow, you have an amazing story to tell. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see Tom. Tom, have you got a question there? I have a question. I'm struggling with a couple of definitions and the I'd like to get John's opinion on the difference between the dominant taught definition of evolution as a godless, blind, purposeless uh, process and the evolution that is used by ASA and CSACA. The difference between those two evolutions. Yeah, thanks, Tom. That's a great question. Um, it was the, actually the question that came up when I went to, when I found out I was accepted to graduate school at Berkeley. It hadn't come up before, but my major prof called me and Vince said, John, he says, the committee has decided to accept you. And I went, <laughs> <laughs> some of you who know me, Berkeley is an amazing place. It's like there's no, I'll get to an answer, Tom. Okay. Berkeley is this amazing place where I learned that in IQ scale, there's no top, right? You get to Berkeley and you see some scary bright people and you go, ah, well, as I used to say to people, my students often, I'm a scientist in spite of mathematics, not because of it, hmm. right? I really struggle with that stuff. And I, I, I've been able to excel. I was a population ecologist and I, you know, I I can do passively, or I can fool people, and I I managed to study hard enough to get into Berkeley. But if you had any doubt about yourself and your place, about two years in, a prof across the hall came out one day and he said, "Oh, I was on the entrance committee when you came here." He says we weren't too sure, <laughs> but Vince made a good case for you, and it's worked out real well. Good to see you here. Well, that's the meritocracy. You learned that hard lesson. And Tom, I can tell you the question you asked about evolution as a godless process, you know, undirected, never came up. I never heard that. It's, it's not part of the theoretical framing that we, we talk about. That's in a conversation that goes on outside the academy and by some scientists, the, the group in particular we call the New Atheist, the Richard Dawkins, mm -hmm. the Sam Harris's, the uh, um, uh, Dennett, I'll think of his name in a second, uh, the philosopher and others, they're, they're the best known. But that's not what day-to-day -day scientists are dealing with and doing. And so the question that my major prof asked me when he calls it, Charlie, we really want you to come. I just have one question for you. Is evolution going to be a problem for you? It was really the only time he talked about it, but he, had, he wanted to know that I wasn't going to stumble because he said, Berkeley is an evolutionary school. I said, I know that, Vince. And that's what I was introduced to by my professors in the, at North Park back in the 1960s is that the theory of evolution is not a barrier 
to Christian faith. As I sometimes say, it is the idea, it is the thing that that Darwin and others finally twigged to, is that, oh, that's how God did it. It's a matter of mechanism and process. The question that you're raising, though, is what is the question of faith, commitment, and meaning and purpose? And I we take that, too. And the CSCA and ASA have been very clear about that again and again. And I think this kind of close it off is that our history, starting in the 1940s through the 50s and the 60s, the 70s and the 80s, is that we've navigated those issues, that these questions are filled in our journal. And it's, it's what we are about. And we've all individually taken that journey. And I'll end with this. Walt Hearn, when I got to Berkeley and I was going to start teaching, Walt said to me something one day that was really helpful. He said, John, I know you're just finishing a PhD at Berkeley, but when you start teaching, would you allow your students to go on the journey that you have gone on? And I went, bingo, light bulb moment. Okay. So that's a, 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 sh a longest short answer, Tom, to, uh, to your good yeah. question. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I think at this time, considering the fact that uh, we're across Canada and it's getting later for some of us, I think we're going to draw our formal time together to a close. Um, before I do that, I'll just uh, remind everyone that you're welcome to stay online uh, after our official close and, and chat with one another and uh, hopefully with John a little bit more. Um, so, John, you have taken us on a journey uh, the past 50 years and more and thinking ahead about the future. And we're so grateful for that and for the encouragement to think about our own journeys and what's been meaningful in them and how they've connected with the CSCA and how we put faith and science together in a serious way. Um, you have just blessed us. You've blessed us by being part of our organization, by sharing with us, by by leading us, and I'm so grateful. So if we could just give John one more round of applause to thank him uh, for his good words. Um, I'd also like to, since this is our wrap-up event of our 50th anniversary year, I'd like to give special recognition once again to our 50th anniversary committee. Many of the members are here and especially to uh, Judy and Rebecca for chairing an amazing year with lots of great activities. So let's give a round of applause to them as well with great Thanksgiving. So I thought I would close us with um, uh, reading the ironic blessing out of uh, the message. Um, let me know if there's something I may have forgotten to mention in closing, Rebecca or Arnold. We're good? Okay. All right then. So, here it is. God bless you and keep you. God smile on you and gift you. God look you full in the face and make you prosper. Amen. Have a good night. I hope we'll see one another again soon at the Winter Symposium and next summer in Washington. Good night, everyone. Bye.